Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I, I, I pray this morning, Lord, as we open up your word, Lord, that you would uh, meet us where we're at. Father, on the day of Pentecost, there were so many different nations there. And the Bible says that each of them heard them speaking in a language that they understood. And so that's what I pray this morning, Father, as I share. I pray that you would interpret it into a language that each person here understands. And Father, speak to our hearts. Lord, what do you want to say to us this morning, Father? Give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Hey, um, I've shared this story before, but I want to share it again. Anyone know how circus elephants are trained? You ever been to a circus and seen these huge hog? Elephants are amazing. They're, they're powerful creatures. They're huge. They're very muscly. They're very in control. Um, but it's amazing when you go to a circus and you ever go out the back of the circus tents, there's a piece of, of wood, a stake about so big that's banged into the ground, and an old tattered piece of rope that ties from that piece of wood to the leg of this huge hulking elephant. And I remember uh, uh, seeing circuses when I was younger, and it always baffled me that how can something so incredibly powerful, how come it doesn't just lift its leg, rip that thing out and go charging through the streets. How is it that that frail piece of rope and that little post is holding such a massive, massive animal? I'm, not, I'm no rocket science, but I know. If I was that big, dude, I'd be flicking that pole out and charging through the streets and, you know, doing these ones. That's what I'd be doing if I looked like an elephant. Um, but they don't. And the reason they don't is because when elephants are small and young, they're trained to think a certain way. So what happens is when they're little... That same peg's driven into the ground, and that same piece of rope, usually what they do uh, is they like to keep the same piece of rope, because that piece of rope has a connotation. It feels a certain way around their leg and so on. So even as the elephant gets bigger and older, they generally try to keep that same uh, piece of rope, because the, the, the elephant associates something with that rope, right? So what happens is when they're little, they tie the, the, they put the post in the ground, they tie the rope to it, tie to the elephant's leg. Now, the elephant tries to pull away, but of course, the elephant is, is small at that stage, not strong enough to pull the post out of the ground. And what also happens is when the elephant's pulling on that, the rope is burning and cutting into the leg. It's quite cruel. And so the, 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 the elephant is beginning to associate stepping away from that thing with being painful, right? right? It starts thinking a certain way. There's no point trying to get away from the post. I can't. I'm stuck here. If I do try to get away, I won't get away, but it will hurt me. There'll be pain. And so this elephant grows up with a certain mentality and a certain mindset. And one day this element, elephant is the biggest thing in the circus, but it's still being held together by that same pole. Why? Because it's trapped by its own thinking. It's a captive of its own thoughts. Now, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks about the power of our thinking. We've been talking about the power of thoughts and how powerful the way that we think is. That, that our thoughts have a lot of control over the way we live our lives. Our thoughts have a lot of control over the things that we will allow ourselves to step into and to do. Our thoughts have control over how deep we're prepared to go in relationships or whether we're even prepared to put ourselves out there. Because for some of us, we won't even put ourselves out there because we've already told ourselves, I'll get rejected. Why? Maybe because when you were younger, that happened once or twice. Or maybe somebody said that you're not worth it and you've got no value. And so we grow up without realizing it and these mindsets get inside of us. And the more you hear something repetitively, this is neuroscience has found this, you hear something repetitively enough, even if it's a lie, you believe it. You hear something long enough, you begin to believe it. So we've been kind of looking at uh, what the Word of God says, what this collection of ancient documents says about our thoughts and the power of our thoughts and our thinking. We've been on a bit of a journey, and I want to take that journey a little step further today and maybe tilt it a little bit in a different direction. Um, if you have a collection of ancient documents that we call a Bible in front of you, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, and we're going to look at verses 2 to 4. Paul, the apostle Paul, this man that was anti-Jesus, that had a radical conversion, and went on and wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament, planted churches, amazing men of God. And he planted a church in this uh, place called Corinth. And he's writing to these believers. Now, does anyone ever think that the church should be perfect? Is anyone here that actually thinks the church should be perfect? Has anyone here ever been in a church and you got frustrated because you looked around and went, why aren't we better than this? We should be more perfect you look at the person next to you, you've been following Jesus, why are you not perfect? Anyone ever thought that? Because if you do, just take, get a cup of coffee, sit down, and just read Corinthians. These guys were messed up. 
Not only were they messed up in a lot of areas, but they seemed to have all these gifts of the Spirit flowing and the Holy Spirit was in their presence. And it makes no sense to my brain. How can you have some of the issues going on amongst you that you have, yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit's moving and they're seeing all kinds of... It doesn't make sense to me, but you know, there's a lot of things about God that doesn't make sense to me either. So Paul writes this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11, 2-4. He says this, he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. He says, I promised you to one husband, to Christ. In other words, I, I, I came, I preached the gospel, you gave your life to Jesus, and I've made a, I, I've, I've made a promise. Uh, uh, I've, I've given you to, to him. I wasn't drawing you to myself. I didn't come and preach about myself. I preached about Jesus, and you, you, you agreed. You saw, and and I've, I've, I've sort of made this promise that I'm taking you to him. A bit like a father walking a daughter down the aisle. The father's not walking it down to marry. The father's walking every step going, at the end of the journey, I'm handing you over to somebody else. That's the point. It's just not about, I'm not trying to draw you to me. I'm walking you down, and I'm handing you over. And that's what he's saying. I'm walking you down the aisle, but I've committed you and promised you to Christ. When we get to the end of that aisle, I'm going to hand you over and Jesus is going to be the one that you're married to. Jesus is going to be the one you're committed to. He says, so I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning. Watch this. Your what? Your minds may somehow be what? Led astray. Led astray. Led astray. I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunnings, our minds may be somehow led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And then he goes on and says, For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, look at what he says. He says, You what? You put up with it easily. You put up with it easily. In other words, if you put up with wrong thinking long enough, it'll lead your life astray. That's what he's saying. He says, my, my concern for you is that, that you're hearing, you've heard this true gospel and been presented with the true Jesus and you, 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 you accepted that and you're heading a certain way. But what's happening now is I'm afraid. I'm afraid that other ideas and voices are coming and your mind is going to be led astray. Your mind is going to be led astray because you're buying into some of these other lies and these other things that you're hearing. And if your mind gets led astray, the reason it's going to get led astray is because when those thoughts come in, you put up with them easily. What has he told them? Go back to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is where Paul says to them, you need to take every thought captive and bring it into the obedience of Christ. He's already said to them. So what he's saying, if you follow the flow, is this. I've told you what's going to happen. You're in a battle. The battleground is up here. There's all kinds of ideologies and thoughts and things coming at you from your past, from your present, from your culture, from your friends, from your family. And then there's the truth as God sees it and says it that's coming at you as well. But he says the battleground's up here. All these things that coming at you. And what you need to do, people, is you need to learn how to do this. Take every thought captive. Why? Because when I capture something, it's in a cage. I sit back. I look at it. Then I can go, is this truth or a lie? Is this fact or fiction? But I can't really do that if, if I don't take it captive. I just let it run around. So why do we take it captive? Then we can judge it properly and go, does this line up? Is this obedient to Christ? Is this what God says or is it not? Is it truth or a lie. He says, this is what we do. The battleground's there. Take your thoughts captive. And then he goes on. He says, but I'm concerned for you. I'm afraid for you because just as Eve was deceived by a thought, I think that you guys are taking in some other stuff and it's looking to me like your mind is getting led astray. And the reason is because you're putting up with it. You're not taking things captive. And we've got to stop putting up with lies and start taking things captive, because if we don't, our mind gets led astray. And where the mind goes, you will go. Where the mind goes, you will go. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. It starts with a thought. Our thoughts are so powerful. What we allow ourselves to dwell on and meditate on is so powerful. Now, now, I didn't get this Adonis-like body by eating cheeseburgers and, and zingers all day, every day, right? I eat zingers and cheeseburgers, just not all day, every day. But the point is this, if you want a healthy body, we're smart enough to know we've really got to think about, if I want a healthy body, I've got to think about what I'm putting into the body. Because whatever I put into the body will eventually come out. Trust me, it's coming out right there on me at the moment. Right? Whatever I put in, it's eventually going to come out. 
Well, the same thing goes for our mind. Whatever you're putting in, it's going to come out. Whatever you are absorbing and taking in, whatever you are allowing to float around in there, whatever thoughts you are not taking captive, you're fertilizing and you're watering, eventually they will take root in your life. And whether you want to or you don't want to, if you let that thought get dominant enough, you are going to do it. You are going to do it. That's just the way we're made. And it's not just new age and it's not just some weird spiritual thing. It's biology. It's, it's the way that God wired this amazing thing called the brain. It's the way he wired us. If you put up with wrong thinking long enough, it will lead your life astray. Now, a question for you to think about, how many of us have put up with wrong thinking long enough? Who feels like there's areas of their life? We've been on this journey. This is our third week. How many of you have noticed some thought patterns or some things, and you've realized, you know what? I've, I've got some, as Joyce Meyer would say, some stinking thinking. Right? I got some stinking thinking. I got some stuff in there that's I've been I've been speaking lies to myself for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, and I've realized I'm living those things out, but now I'm starting to take it captive. I'm going, hang on a second. That's just not true. Why am I living that out? Why am I letting that thought dictate my, my whether I take that opportunity or I don't? Why am I letting that thought dictate whether I say yes or no? Why am I letting that thought dictate? whether I step out or I stay seated? Why am I letting that thought dictate the next step of my life when it's not true? It's just not true. See, this is part of the hard work of our faith. It's part of the work of our faith. We've got to renew our minds. We've got to take thoughts captive. Paul said to the Corinthians, who takes the thoughts captive? He said, you do. I can't take your thoughts captive. I don't know what Jackie's thinking right now. I, I, I can't take it captive. I don't know. She's sitting there, she's thinking, geez, that guy's amazing. <laughs> geez, I married a hottie. Is she thinking that? Or is she thinking, move it on, come on. I remember preaching many, many years ago when I first sort of uh, started preaching a bit more regularly and I was preaching in a uniting church and uh, I'm in there and they're, you know, it's very uh, start, finish and so on. So I'm preaching and I'm kind of just getting warmed up and I'm thinking, dude, you're killing it, man. You're right in the zone here. And, and I look across at my wife for a bit of support and she goes like this. And I think she's going, yeah, honey, woo, come on, preach it, preach it. So I kept preaching, I'm going, going, going. Anyway, in the end, she said, what were you doing? I was saying, wrap it up, man, wrap it up, you know. <laughs> I don't know what she's thinking. So if I don't know what she's thinking, I can't take your thoughts captive and you can't take mine. So what you've got to learn to do is take your own thoughts captive because nobody else can do it for you. Not even God. God won't do it. God won't do it. God will give you the right thoughts. You've got to learn to discern them. You've got to learn to know what's right thinking and what's not. How many of us have put up with wrong thinking long enough? How much more time are you going to give over to wrong thinking? How many more opportunities are you prepared to sacrifice on the altar of wrong thinking? How many more relationships are you prepared to sabotage? How much more negativity do you want to fill your mind with? How many more lies are you going to fertilize about yourself? about God and about the world around you? How much longer? Now understand this, wrong thinking is not just a mental problem. It's a spiritual problem. Because it's the number one way the devil tries to influence people who are made in the image of God to stop reflecting the reality and goodness of God to one another. Think about it. He says, I'm concerned that your minds will be led astray like Eve's mind was led astray. The devil didn't go after Eve's actions. He didn't take control of her, possess her, and make her do something. He just offered her a thought. He just offered her an alternative perspective to the perspective God said, didn't, didn't he? He just planted a seed and went, rest is up to you. Do with this what you will. And she watered, and she fertilized, and then she acted on it. Because our dominant thoughts are taking us somewhere in life, whether we like it or not. Eve's deception took place in the mind first because she entertained wrong thoughts. In other words, she put up with it easily enough. She put up with it easily enough. In, in an age of mental health, in an age of, of so much stuff going on and so many things being diagnosed and labelled and so on, and yet we all know so many of them start up here, don't they? What a powerful witness if the church 
or to go, okay, by the power of the Spirit, teach me, God. How do I take my own thoughts captive? And then I start taking my thoughts captive and I start believing truth and I start living truth and walking in truth and lies begin to disappear. And the life of God begins to flow through me. What a great testimony that would be to a world that's scratching the back of its head going, we don't know how to stop this epidemic. We don't know how to get, get a handle on this. It's getting worse and worse and worse. What a great opportunity for the church to go, hey, we've got some things we can add to this situation. We've got some pointers. Are you taking thoughts captive? There was a guy called Paul years ago. He, he, he told this, this bunch of people, the Corinthians, he said, take it captive. How do you do that? Well, here's how we do it. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to change your thinking. What a great opportunity for the church. So let's go full circle, and we're going to head back where we started from three weeks ago. And this is why Paul challenged the Roman Christians. He said, you've got to renew your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Here's what Paul says to the Christians in Rome. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I love when we sing worship, but that, that's the true definition of worship, isn't it? It, it, it's, we're up here and we can sing songs, but the challenge for us is offering your body as a living sacrifice means does the song continue for the other six and a half days out there? Does that song continue? Does it move off your lips, into your hips, your legs, and do you live it out for the next six and a half days? That's proper worship. This is great. I love singing. I love that aspect of worship. But worship is our whole life. It's a living sacrifice. It's not just a moment, three songs, I've done my worship this week. No. When you walk out that door, you're going to continue the worship service. What's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? He says, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. And watch this. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, right? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And how are we transformed? He says, by the renewing of your mind. He doesn't say be transformed by getting someone way more spiritual and holy to lay hands on you and pray, transformation. Oh! He doesn't say just uh, you know, go to a conference and get someone to spray you with holy water. And you'll... No, he says, no, no, this is the work of the believer. Transform your mind. Renew your mind. Who does it? You do. Can I renew Jackie's mind? No, I can't. I don't know what's racing around inside of there, and I don't know what's racing around in yours, but I know what's racing around up in here. And I know when I take it captive, whether it lines up with what God says or not, I said, they're the thoughts that I have the opportunity, and this is the only mind I can renew because it's the only one I've got. <laughs> it's the only one I've got. I wish I had a couple of them. I've only got one, right? And I can only renew my mind, and you can only renew yours. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Each of us are going to do one of two things. If you don't take seriously your mind and your thoughts, if you don't take seriously the fact that your dominant thoughts are leading you somewhere in life, whether you want to go there or not, whether you like it or not, your dominant thoughts are leading you somewhere. They're taking you somewhere. You've got one of two choices. You either conform to the pattern of this world. That takes no effort. That takes no effort. Just hang out in the world long enough and you will be conformed. You will be shaped and molded. As a matter of fact, before each of you came to Christ, you were probably conformed to a pattern. You probably didn't have a lot to do with it because people said things to you. You had experiences, disappointments, hurts, highs, lows, all these kinds of things that made you think a certain way about life, a certain way about yourself, a certain way about God, and it all kind of came, and you didn't really have much, and we kind of like, ships of the sea, we're tossed here and there and everywhere, and one day I'm Arthur, one day I'm Martha, and so on, and then I grow up one day. And I'm living a certain way. And inside of me is going, this is not me. This is not who I want to be. It's not the life I want and so on. Well, I'll guarantee you, sit back and look at your dominant thoughts because they probably brought you to the place that you are. And if you want a different destination, then you've got to change up here. Because if you don't, you'll keep going in the same direction that you're going. And so will I. Whether we like it or not, in big and small ways, we're living the life that our dominant thoughts push us towards. I had a funny experience um, this week. I was sitting down on our back uh, patio and I had my computer there and I'm just sort of, you know, uh, putting together some thoughts for it, the message. And, and while I'm sitting there, I did this funny thing. I'm on the back porch, I'm sitting down and all of a sudden I started to get agitated. Right? I started to get agitated. I'm thinking, why are you getting agitated? And then I looked down at my feet and my feet are on the ground. Right? Now, some time back, at 11 o'clock at night, I made the ghastly mistake of walking to my back deck and flicking on the light. And what do you think I saw on my deck? And everyone that's been at a rise for more than 12 and a half minutes knows how I feel about snakes. Right? They're still the devil. I hate them. So anyway, I flicked on the light as this dirty great big tail of a snake goes under a chair. 
and then came back out on my back there. And so what happened then was ever since then, without even realising it, because I don't like snakes, I'm thinking so much about this. Snake. Could be a snake under the chair, could be a snake. And that's all I kept telling myself every time I looked at my back deck or I walked out. I got into a habit then of five times a night flicking the light on and off just to see. You know, It's crazy, I still do it. Every now and then I'll just flick it. Not on there, you know? There's somewhere in my brain, I took in a thought that a snake lives under my chair. Snakes love my... Like, I started thinking this stuff, and it's funny, I'm sitting there getting all agitated, and I realise, you know, that's, you've planted a thought, you've watered it and fertilised it, now you cannot even enjoy sitting on your back deck anymore because you think there's a snake under that chair. And I'm sitting there, and I've got to... Okay, I've got to move, I'm going to lift my feet. There's nothing there. It's not real. There's nothing happening. But up here, it's as if it's real. And I'm fidgeting, you know? I go to bed at night. And, and I don't know if anyone's like me. When I was a kid, most young people, some of you might relate to this, I used to sleep with like one leg on the bed and one arm and the rest on the floor and, you know, sometimes wrapped around the side of the bed, half me under the bed, half on top. Weird things you can do with your body when you're young. But I had bits and pieces hanging all over the place, you know? And then one day, I watched this show. Anyone ever seen Hamish and Andy? I watched an episode of Hamish and Andy. Long story short, a lady went to sleep one night and she's got her arm hanging over the edge of the bed and what do you think she woke up and was chewing on her arm? A snake. I'm telling you, they are the devil. There's a snake hanging on her arm, right? And I watched this show and I'm thinking, oh man, if you hang your arm over the edge of a bed, who knows what's there? You know what? To this day, I wake up with a finger on ah! Pull the finger back. I can't let anything anymore hang over the edge of a bed and I blame Hamish and Andy for that. Because a, a thought was planted and I've continued to think about it and water it and fertilize it and it kind of controls the way I act now. I literally can't put my arm over. I lay there the other night and I thought, I'm going to put my arm over. I'm just going to prove who's boss. I'm going to take that baby captive. And then after a couple of minutes, like, I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Pull my arm back. I can't do it. In little ways, but also in big ways. How, how many big areas of life are we still got wrong thinking and it's determining and dictating? what we do. If I do that, everyone's going to look at me. <laughs> if I lift my hands and worship me, everyone's going to notice me. The reality is, no one's going to care. Because they're not here to look at you, they're here to look at Jesus. You know? If I go downtown and you know, walk down the street, how many people walk down the street and we, oh, like, because there's this thing in us telling us, oh, people look at you, you they think you look stupid or you, you walk funny or your clothes are old or whatever or whatever it is. How many of us never, we don't put ourselves out there in relationships. We, 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 we just don't want to put ourselves out there and approach somebody and go, hey, hey, would you, you know, would you like to have a coffee or hey, can we go for lunch or whatever. I'm not just talking uh, a boy, uh, you know, uh, boy, girl, male, female relationships. Although I, do, I know people that won't put themselves out there because they've already decided I'm going to be rejected. Nobody could ever like me. Why? Well, I had a bad relationship once. Okay. Call that one a fail and move on. Don't stop putting yourself out there. Don't stop meeting people. Don't stop making friends. Yeah, but I tried this course once and I failed. Call it a fail, but move on. Have another crack. Try something else. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. But we have these thoughts that grab a hold of us, and before you know it, we're living out whatever our dominant thoughts are in life. And how many of us are missing out because we're giving into those dominant thoughts? We're missing out on the life that God has for us and the life that God wants to give to us. Whether we like it or not, in big and small ways, we're living the life that our dominant thoughts are pushing us towards. So renewing our mind, according to Romans, this is what it means. It means that we learn to interpret life through the lens of what God says about us, what God says about himself, what God says about life. Instead of the lens of our own experiences, disappointments, hurts, preferences, or current cultural perspectives. What does God say? What does God say? God is not a man that he would tell a lie. You know, you know one very sad fact about the church in the West today? We are so biblically illiterate because we can't be bothered reading the Bible. We can't be bothered. We've tricked ourselves into thinking we're too busy. We're not too busy. We're just distracted with a whole bunch of things that at the end of the day, be honest with ourselves and go, they're a better priority to me than the word of God is. It's just where we're at. 
I'm a, I'm a big believer that if we want to move forward in life, the first thing we've got to do is acknowledge where we're standing. Just be humble enough to go, you know what? Yeah. I barely ever read the Word of God. I barely ever pick it up. I, th- I only know God says that because somebody else said it. A preacher said it once or I got on a podcast and they said, I've never picked it up and looked at it myself. You know? John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32. Jesus said this. He said to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples. And then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. In Romans 12, the word for renew your mind, that word literally means to refurnish. Anyone ever refurnished a place? You ever refurnished? We, we bought a, a, a new lounge recently. We've been waiting for the kids to all leave home, you know, so that we can be like big people and buy a lounge that we know the kids won't destroy. No, no offense. Uh, and then four days later, the kid comes home. It's like, really? Should have waited another five years. Um, anyway, we got this lounge. And so what happened? It arrived in boxes the other day. And what have I got to do with that lounge? Well, we, we, to refurnish, it means two things. Number one, I've got to bring in the new. But number two, I've got to get out the old. I've got to replace what's in there with something that's better. Amen? We've got to replace what's up here with something that's better. Now, now, New Age Zen thinking would say, just empty your mind. You don't empty your mind. Your mind's never empty. There's always stuff going on up in there. 60,000 thoughts a day run through your head. And you think you can empty your mind? You can't empty your mind. But what you can do is replace what's in there with something that's better. You can upgrade your mind with a lot of better thoughts about who God is, a lot better thoughts about who you are, a lot better thoughts about your neighbor, about the church, about the world around you, a lot better thoughts there. There, Where are they? Well, I actually believe they're in here. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying here. So the Jews who believed, he said this, he said, if you hold to my teachings, that means abide in, stay in, uh, uh, hang around. Let me give you a word you're all familiar with, marinade. Anyone ever marinate meat? Yep, you marinate meat. What do you do? You get the meat and you get the sauce of the marinate and you put it there. And the thing is that when you marinate something, it's not like just putting something on top of it. You, 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 you put it around it and you soak it in. And the idea is not just to have it on, but to get it in. Is that right? To get it in the meat. So when you cut that meat, that marinade, that flavor, it's not just on the outside. It goes right down to the very core of that piece of meat, whatever it is that you're cooking. And that's what this word means. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, if you hold to my teachings, if you marinate in my teachings, you're really my disciples and then you'll know truth and then the truth will set you free in other words my will for you is freedom but before you can be free you need to expose you need exposure to the truth and the truth you need exposed to is my word you've got to be exposed to my word because my word is truth i want you to be free but there's only one way to be free i'm telling you there's only one way to get free and if you're genuinely my disciple and and, and you're marinating my word, here's what I'm going to tell you. The end game of marinating in my word is freedom for you. Freedom. You're locked up in how you see yourself. Marinate in my word. What does it say about you? And find freedom. You're locked up in in what you think about me. Marinate in my word. Stop getting on Google and saying, is God good? Stop typing into Facebook. Someone tell me what you think about God. Get into his word. Is God good? I'm telling you, this word says he's pretty good. So marinating what God says about himself, how he sees you, how he sees you, marinating that, let it get on the inside of you because that's the truth that refurnishes what's going on up here, pushes out the old, fill it with something new, something better, and begin to find the freedom that Jesus created us to have. Because we were called to be free. He who the Son makes free is free indeed. John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How is he stealing, killing, and destroying? He's getting up in here and messing around with your thinking. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life, and not just human existence, but an abundant type of life. And he's speaking that to people who are breathing biologically alive with blood flowing through their veins. Yet he says to them, I've come to bring you life. In other words, it's not just about existing. I want to give you something that you're never going to have apart from me. You're not going to have it apart from me. You'll seek for it with all your heart. You'll seek and you'll try this and you'll try that and you'll go there and you'll go here. You won't find it until you come to me. You will not find it until you come to me. I cooked butter chicken recently, uh, a few years back. But you know, some, some of us when we cook butter chicken, we buy the sauce, right? Huh? 
It's not like some years back and Jackie's cooked every meal since. I'm just saying, in this one illustration, one time in my life I decided to cook butter chicken, but I said I'm not going to use a sauce, I'm going to make it Indian style, because we lived in India uh, for a number of years and it's my favourite dish. And I said, I'm, so I got on YouTube and I found an Indian chef and I, all the, and I got the ingredients and I bought the ingredients, I got a mortar and pestle and ground everything up and made, I started at 9 in the morning, it was ready by 6pm, that's how long it took me. But what they do, what they do there is, see, when we cook it here in Australia, you throw the chicken in, you sizzle it, you add the sauce. No, 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 not in India. What they do is they make the sauce, put the sauce in a pot, boil the sauce. When the sauce is boiling, throw the raw chicken in. They marinate the chicken in the flavors. And I'm telling you, it's absolutely amazing and so different to what we do over here. And we're kind of like that with our, with our, with our time in the wood, with our Christianity. We kind of wear the meat and we just chuck a little bit on us every now and then. Hopefully there's enough flavor that people can see it. You can see it on me, so I'd say that's enough. But it doesn't matter whether they can see it on you. Is it in you? Is it in you? Does it get in you? Because when the Word of God gets in you and you start refurnishing your mind and taking out the old and bringing in the new, that's when we really begin to experience freedom and life the way God intended. Many of us never get there because we don't want to do the work of renewing our mind. We want to pray. We want God to do it all. But God says, hang on a second. I took out your dead spirit and I've given you a new spirit. I took out your heart of stone, I gave you a heart of flesh. I placed my spirit within you. I've given you everything you need to do that which you need to do. Everything you need to successfully do what God asks us to do, we can do. The thing is this, do we want to do it? Do we want to do it? That's the question. Joshua 1.8, just very quickly wrap it up. Joshua 1.8, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. What's he saying to Joshua? Marinate in it. Marinate in it. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Then, when? Once you've marinated. Once you've marinated enough to the point where what you know you begin to do, then you're going to be prosperous and then you're going to have success. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, David writes this, Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the steps with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in a company of mockers. In other words, I'm not hanging there getting all my input from those types of people. He says, I'm not hanging there. He says, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God, and who what? Meditates. Marinates. Meditates in it. On this law, when? Day and night. What are you doing? You're marinating in the word of God. You're marinating in God's thoughts and God's words. He says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Where does it start? It starts by marinating in the right stuff. Amen? It starts by marinating in the right stuff. I love what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah says this. When your words came, I ate them. I ate them. Now, for those of you that are younger, I don't want you eating paper. That's not what he's saying. All right? What he's saying is this. I got your word inside of me. I got it in me, man. I got it in me. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. I'm yours. And because I'm yours, you know what I do? I take your word and I get it on the inside of me because I know your word brings freedom. You will know the truth. How are you going to know the truth? Constant exposure. And once you know that truth, guess what? You're going to be set free. This is the promise of Jesus. See, the world's wisdom is different to God's. But if you're not deliberately marinating in God's word, then by default, you're being marinated in the world whether you like it or not. By default, we're we're either being marinated on purpose or we're being marinated by default. And again, whose choice is it? It's mine and yours. The world says, hate your enemies. Jesus says, love them. The world says, hoard wealth for yourself. Jesus says, be generous and give. The world says your value comes from what you do. Jesus says your value is found in who you are. You're made in his image. The world says money is power. And Jesus says money is the least of all life's riches. All the things you can pursue in life, money is the least of it. It's the least of it. The world says peace can be found in something out there. But Jesus says you'll never find true peace unless you let me come in here. Unless you let me come in here. Nick, can I get you to jump up on guitars? You'll never find peace unless you let me come in here. So what was the lie that Eve was prepared to entertain? What was the first lie the devil ever sold to anybody? This was it. The lie was this. If you want to become all you can be, then you need to move outside the boundaries of God's word. 
Did God really say that to you? If you eat that tree, you know you'll be like God. You'll be all you can be. You'll be a better version of yourself. If you just get outside of what God's... Don't, don't, don't limit yourself to what he says. <laughs> don't limit yourself to what he... All God's trying to do is kind of... He's robbing you. Did God really say that? You can't eat that? You can have every tree here, but you can't have that one tree. Seriously? Well, God's... God's I don't think he's got your best interest at heart. Because if you eat that tree, you'll be like God. And isn't God cool? Wouldn't you love to be like that? And she watered that thought, fertilized that thought to the point where she took the apple and ate it. And for 2,000 years, 4,000, 6,000, however long, whether you're a long earth or a short earth or whatever, it's the same lie that the devil speaks to people. Don't go to Jesus because he doesn't have your best interests at heart. If you go to Jesus, you're not going to be all you can be. You won't find the fullness of life in the confines of God's word. You need to go outside of that. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, can I encourage you? Get to know him. Can I encourage you? Open your heart up to the possibility and reality of God. And don't tell me that I Googled once about God. And no, you know what? Sorry, but you go on Google and ask stuff about faith. Most of what you're going to hear is probably baloney. If you're genuinely serious about wanting to know about God, you've done the right thing. Good first step. Walk into the doors of a church gathering. I don't care if it's here or somewhere else, but be here. Second thing I'd be saying is get a copy of this collection of ancient documents written over 1,600 years on three separate continents. It's a miracle. This book here, people say, I've never seen a miracle. Hold your Bible up. That's a miracle that that thing still exists with the wars that have been fought over it and the nations that have tried to destroy it. And we all have 1,000 copies at our disposal. That's a miracle right there. It's not just a book. Nobody writes a book with 27 or 33, whatever different authors, over 1,600 years on three separate continents, and it tells the same story. They don't collude. They don't talk. No one, you can't do that. You can't make that stuff up. God's real, and his word is true. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. See, here's the thing. I love butter chicken. It's my favorite dish. But if you had have described it to me before I tried it, I probably would have said, oh, no thanks. Butter. I don't like butter. Tomato paste. I'm not a fan of tomatoes. Garam masala. Salt. No, you keep that one. But you know what I did? I tasted. And I went, ooh, this is good. This is good. There are a lot of people out there and someone's told you the ingredients and you look at the ingredients and gone, nah, nah. I was having a conversation with a a person yesterday. We were chatting back and forth and they made the statement, so what you're saying is they've just got to kind of believe and dive in. I said, yeah, taste and see. It's not until that thing hits your tongue because you made the decision to pick it up and put the spoon there. Some people are sitting back their whole life going, I want to dive into God. God, you do the work. You make it happen. I just want another miracle. I want another this, another that. There are people all around the world who've seen miracles firsthand and walked away from Jesus. It's a choice. I want to pray for some people this morning. Two things. Number one, if you're here and you do not know Jesus, you do not know Jesus, I would love for you to to come forward and we would love to pray for you. We would love to be there with you and, as Paul said, walk you down that aisle and hand you over to Jesus. We would love to do that. This could be the beginning of an amazing journey for you. I did it at 19 years of age. Didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really understand it all. I just knew that there's a God there and he's got plans and purposes. I just knew that I didn't come from a cockroach. I knew there had to be something more than just evolution and everything unheard. I can stand on a cockroach and squash it. It doesn't bother me. I could not put a knife to a baby's throat. There's something different about the two things. Why? I don't know why, but maybe God makes sense of it all. And I've since found that he does. If you don't know Jesus, I would love to pray with you this morning. We would love to introduce you to him. And the second group of people I want to pray for this morning is, I know that there are people here, and, 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 and you're listening to this for the last three weeks, and you're going, yeah, I know. I know I've got to get a hold of some of this stuff. Maybe some of you are afraid. What is that going to mean? Because if I replace these lies, what I'm comfortable with, what's natural, what's normal, and I start replacing that with the word of God, what does that mean for me? Where will that take me? Some people love staying in the shallows, don't they, with God? We walk in up to our ankles. We love being there because we're in a bit of control. 
But Jesus says, no, no, I want you to go right out there and start paddling in the water where the currents start to come into play and you're dependent. And the more we walk, the more scary it is, but the more we encounter God and the more real God becomes to us. So I want to pray for you too. If you're here this morning and you know that you're in that place, I'm holding back a bit from God here because of this and so on. And I just want to take another step forward into the deeper water this morning. I want to get control of some of these things because these thoughts are robbing me of the life of God. They're robbing me of good relationships. They're robbing me of opportunity, robbing me of potential. They're robbing me of creativity, and I'm sick of it. And we want to pray with you this morning that the power of the Holy Spirit, your decision in the Holy Spirit, you can do this. You can do this. Amen. So, Father, I I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for uh, this time, God. I thank you for the power of your word. Lord, your, your, your Spirit's presence with us. I thank you, Father, for the reality of your presence. And Lord, for each person in this room right now, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to them, God? And Lord, would they respond not to a guy up the front, but let them respond to the voice of God in their spirit. Let them respond to what you are saying. And Father, as we leave this place, I pray for the next six and a half, seven days. Lord, there are people in our community that do not know Jesus. They don't know you. They don't know you. And some of them have got some pretty weird images of you. So, Father, I pray that you would give each person in this room that believes in Jesus, each person even online that believes in Jesus, I pray in the next seven days, would you give us opportunities to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God, somebody that right now doesn't understand it. Let us be that voice of God to them and point them to Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said.